Hanging with Bears, episode 607. This is a special music episode. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming in. We've got a bunch of people joining us tonight, uh, a bunch of different bear musicians, and I'm looking forward to it. We're going to try to get as many people on at the same time as we can. Patrick, what's going on? I like your clean-shaven look. I feel that we are more connected than ever now. Cruise One Nation, Wild Meadows Farm, Ontario. What's going on? Mr. Witt's here, right on. Good to see you guys. What's everybody up to tonight? I'm in my I'm in my lair. I'm in my warehouse. It's kind of cold. <laughs> I have a Riverside beer. What's going on? I have a, a broken warehouse heater and I got a new control valve. I need to install it. I gotta get up on a get up on a ladder and dinner right on Artos. I gotta catch the uh, stream that you did with Bullshit Machine Bear last night. It looked interesting. I didn't get a chance to hear it today, but I'm going to listen to it because I, I'm sure it was a great conversation. Anybody that doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, Bullshit Machine Bear had Arto Survival on last night, and they were talking about a topic that's been kind of on people's minds lately because of Owen, uh, the, the, the whole demon uh, sort of demon possession sort of thing. Uh, Patrick, Arto Survival is very well versed in that and he has a lot of great things to say about it and it's a big part of his redemption story sunflower mama bear what's going on uh we have trident bear here and uh he's the first music guest that we have so i'm gonna just invite him on yeah mr witt said it was a great stream with with bullshit machine bear that's cool uh Music Bears here. Okay, I'm going to invite both these guys on here, see if we can get this rocking right away. I guess Trident Bear had to dip out. He's not showing up on the list. If Trident, if you're still here, invite yourself. All right, Music Bear. All right. Hey, how's it going? Great to have you. Man, you're right on time. Yeah, I've just been practicing and and uh, yeah, I just saw it come out, come on. So I was like, might as well just be on time, punctual. It's Very good. good. Been it late due to uh, blowing a breaker right before I went on stream. Uh, I just invited MJ Corum. Uh, he declined. Okay. I didn't, I tried to. I was supposed to get a hold of him before this to make sure he knew. Anyway, not to go into that. How are you? Good. Just been practicing all day. I uh, put some new strings on the bass. So that's like the first time in five years, I, I want to say, on that bass. Uh, mostly because I was on uh, flat wounds, so it was okay if everything just stayed dull forever. Right. Um, and finally just went for some um, some steel high beams nice yeah. well there were rumors back in the day of those studio guys from um i think guys one one studio great was joe osborne he was on at any given time in the 70s he was on you know half the top 10 hits on the radio mm -hmm. and they said that i think he used flat wounds and those guys would leave their flat wounds on for decades yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I really like the sound of them. The only reason I ended up switching was because I'm doing some more like slap bass type type stuff lately. So I uh, just need that treble. Right. I, but those flat ones are good for like the Motown and the R&B and the dub reggae type stuff. It's so. got that. It's got that kind of dull funk. Yeah. Yeah. So Almost. I, I kind of it was bittersweet taking them off because it sounds really good with you know, the first slap, but then, you know, so I wish I had a couple bases to work with, but, you know. We've already gotten the first comment on my beard growing in, which is fantastic. Thank you. It is <laughs> already half grown in, which is great. Yeah. Uh, Arto Survival said he had a flat wound J base when he was into Jocko. That's cool. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Here doesn't know who Jaco Pastorius is. Go watch the documentary about him. It's it's fascinating. You know, uh, Music Bear and I grew up on Jaco, so we know all about it. But uh, 
It's good stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's, I have a J base, so that's exactly what I was doing. Yep. For a little bit. Uh, in a minute, I want you to show that base, but I'm going to try to invite a few more people. Um, I didn't talk to Susie G ahead of time, but I'd love to bring her on here. So let's see if, if she can come on. She was on with, uh, she was on with Copper Bear a couple weeks ago, and that was awesome, but we can get her on again. If she'd like to, I don't know if she's, I'm putting her on the spot because we didn't talk about it beforehand. I hope she's got all her makeup on and everything. She, <laughs> whatever women do, I don't know what. <laughs> uh, she declined. Okay, very cool. Uh, can you show the base? Yeah. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Back up a little bit. It's a, it's a five string. That's awesome. Yeah, I like the five string. <laughs> Yeah, it's got that really slinky high frequency sound on it now that those steel strings are on there. And I thought about doing the nickel and kind of finding the middle ground, but then I just decided let's go the complete opposite from the flat wounds and I'm happy with them. It's good. That now is that at a low B? Yeah, that's a low yeah, low B. Yeah. Can you can you explain to the people who may or may not be musicians? Uh, what that what that means in terms of the history of electric bass and adding the low B is actually taking it down another half an octave or more or, le or more or less. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, most most basses just have the four strings, and that's uh, these four strings. So then that would be just kind of tuned down the octave from a uh, normal guitar. So E, A, D, G. Um, and that's in fourth. So, you know, E, uh, E, F, G, A, that's four, uh, A, B, C, D, that's four, right? Um, so it's just one more up. So it'd be B, uh, B, C, D, E. So that's four, right? So it's just another one lower and, uh, jazz guys like it, um, metal guys like it. And, um, yeah, it's just nice to get that low, those low bass notes in there. Right. Invited, uh, I just invited Arto Survival because he is a musician and uh, uh, he declined also. Okay, everybody's just declining. I'm just, I'm just doing, uh, inviting everybody, whatever. Um, and Grungy's, Grungy, invite yourself because you're not even showing up on the list. Grungy's a non, a, a persona non grata or something. Some of Grungy's videos lately have been really awesome. He's been playing in that shop. Yeah. He was playing with that. I think he was playing with one of your Waz uh, in his most recent one, right? The Buick Waz. That was actually the Waz that I used at the first festival. Yeah, he, I gave it to him. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to pick one of those up from you at some point. Yes. I was supposed to take it to him at the festival, and I forgot to pack it. I actually might have subconsciously thought he wouldn't make it. No. <laughs> Grudge you, not me. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the whole car trouble getting to the second festival, you know, yeah, car maybe he's having car trouble getting to the Instagram stream. <laughs> Nighthawk, I did not invite you. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Although, what's up, Nighthawk? Yeah, you guys are you guys are good pals, real life friends, friends in yeah. real life. I'm gonna try to get Pop and Fresh in here. He's uh. He's another musician. A lot of people don't know that because he just likes to talk about his fishing. No worries, mate. Okay, yeah, he's definitely down in Australia now, so. <laughs> hey, yeah, uh, so give it. Some people know your history, some people don't. So uh, can you sum up your musical career uh, for everybody? Yeah. Um... So I started playing music when I was really young and um, I played piano first and played piano for about uh, like seven years and then got into guitar because all the friends wanted to do uh, some rock and some metal. So we got into Metallica and Megadeth and Pantera and all that kind of thrash metal stuff. So I started playing electric um, and at the time I was singing in a lot of choirs in high school um 
so I developed an ear there and then uh, went to school for music. Um, and I've been teaching uh, ever since the end of high school. So I've just been teaching guitar, uh, piano, and then eventually started teaching ukulele and um, in bass as well. So, um, and along the way, I've been in several bands. I was in a metal band in high school and then uh, kind of went off metal into more chill styles of music and uh, started, you know, my own project uh, called I Love. It's uh, like like an eyeball. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of like chill, soul, funk, R&B, and been doing that for, uh, yeah, over a decade. And that's been uh, really the, the bulk of my musical background. Yeah. You're, a friend of yours came up with a, a really crafty way to describe your music. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I remember you were you you had asked me a way to to think about how to describe my music, and uh, because I think you were you were trying to put together something for maybe one of the older hanging with bear streams right before the festival. Right. And so at the time, I'm like, I don't even, I don't even know. You, I think you had put rock and soul and R and B or something like that, and I had described it as nature soul because I had just made the song called Watercolor Sky, and it was very inspired by just the nature scene. And um, yeah, and and I'm I'm very inspired by nature and just natural sounds and those sorts of things. So uh, maybe that's what you're thinking of. Yeah. Okay. We have Trident Bear coming on. I invited Grunty. No. Yeah. There was a there was a, a term that a friend of yours came up with. It's it's escaping me. Trident Bear, what's going on? Hey, Trident. How are you doing? Yeah. You're uh you're why don't you try we'll try again in a little while. You're you're not really coming in. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's the same for everybody. All right, we're going to try Spool Bear. He's a drummer, and he's a famous bear because he's, he's up there in uh, Idaho. Let's get... Uh... I don't, I'm trying to get rid of... Uh, try, hey, Trident, can you... Can you X yourself out for a second? Okay, there he goes. We'll get him well, back. Yeah. Nice try, Trident Bear. <laughs> All right, and uh, now we're. <laughs> this is all just going to be talking about inviting people. Um, Spool Bear may come on. That'd be cool. He lagged out, right? Trident Bear uh, streams some of his. Uh, he kind of he's uh, doing a bunch of acoustic stuff, and he's uh, like writing some tunes and stuff. So now we've got Spool Bear. There How's that? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it sound good. All right, cool. Hey man, good to see. Hey, you. nice to meet you. Yo, good talking to you. Nice to meet you too. Cool Bear and I have been talking behind the scenes. He's uh, coming down. To the band. It's going to be quite. I've heard their, I've heard their song video, and uh, it's a really cool jam band. Cool Bear is a great drummer, so I'm really looking forward. To it. Yeah, I've been talking to the guys. They're really excited. You know, they all want to come down and jam with you guys. Awesome. Show you guys what we're about. Awesome. Uh, how many people are... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Who is that? This is my uh, third boy. This is Rigel. Say hi to the people. What's the name again? This is Rigel. Rigel. Wow, what a cool name. Say hi, buddy. <laughs> yeah, him and Seacow enter the uh, the mullet contest every year, and Seacow always wins, but we'll get him one day. No, that's a good-looking mullet there. I've never seen one that quite that young. <laughs> Joe, I don't have you on video. Oh, I'm sorry. Some people would tell you that's a plus uh, as of this <laughs> I'm, I'm actually buying orders. I've been ordered not to stream until my beard comes back, and I'm just um, streaming in the of, of the... Basically, fight the power. That's what we always say. Fight the power, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you uh, you've definitely inspired me to never shave my beard ever. So thank you. <laughs> uh, that's what we've learned. The biggest um, upside to this whole uh, incident is that it's serves as a lesson to men. Yeah, yeah well, totally. And my kids love pulling on it. I don't think I heard the reason uh, what the impetus to shave the beard was, or like what what that story is. The, it's there's no story. I'm time because I'm late. And I think it's okay to trim a beard, so I ran the two. That's all. Just that, and I, I've done it all my life. So there was no. I didn't lose a bet. I didn't have a. Incident or anything, nothing. Just... Uh, Spool Bear, uh, can you explain your band and uh, some of the other bands you've been in and your, your history? Yeah, so my band, uh, we're called Spool Effect. We're a North Idaho based jam band. We do a lot of stuff rooted in funk, rock, reggae, and improv. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so a lot nice. of our set is just made up on the fly and it's it's awesome to have a couple guys to to do that with, you know. And uh I come from a LA based band. Uh we are called Dead Mystic and we are more kind of like like grungy, heavy rock type stuff and you know, so it's it's been a change moving to more mellow like reggae, you know, music like that. I've definitely uh got rid of the double kick pedal and I've been Borrowing a single kick pedal from Tempo Bear, which has been awesome. Nice, That's, but uh, I don't. I yeah, don't my two other guys, you know, there. Uh, hey, Music Bear, have you heard of many people going backwards from the double kick back to a single? Going backwards? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, there's. I mean, what's the point of having one if you're not going to play, you know, that type of music with it? So I, I, not outright like. I haven't heard people say specifically, oh, yeah, I just stopped using it. But, I mean, well, I mean, it, it, if you do want double, you can just do a, a quick heel toe, you know. And that's usually as tasteful as you'd want to be in certain scenarios, right? It's like not going to want to do um, – yeah, I mean, really, it's like me metal is the only style I really hear double bass on besides, like um, – What's that Led Zeppelin song? Is it uh, something o Ocean? Something Ocean? I can't remember. Do, 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 right? It's got that. Yeah. Word. I'm blanking on. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of people's favorite Led Zeppelin song. I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, is Spool Bear, is, the, is your current band's music, where did I see it? On YouTube? How, how can people go hear it? uh we're on we're on youtube um i forget what channel we're under i don't even think it's called school effect it's like dye painting or something <laughs> uh so it's kind of hard to find them i mean you could search spool effect and the videos will come up okay cool uh, but we're on facebook and instagram as spool effect as well and you because you can catch us there and this is a brand new channel you just started this instagram today to come on here today yeah i literally just this account the spool effect account i started it like an hour ago maybe yeah maybe two that's that's great that you went to the trouble to do that to come on here and your previous yeah, like, been... that stuff up on youtube uh dead mystic yeah that stuff's all on youtube as well 
So um, it, there's it, another it, band. It, it, that's it, the, is it spelled just normal M Y S T I C? Yeah, and it's just Dead Mystic. You know, there's another band out there that are playing, and they're called uh, the Mystic Dead. Ah. So don't confuse us with them. Okay. How old were you when you got your first drum set? Um, oh, man. I, I probably bought my first drum set when I was, I think I was like a sophomore in high school, so about 15 or so. Yeah. And then I've just been kind of playing off and on ever since. And what did your parents now think? Now I'm on like my What did my parents think? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I brought my drum set home and they signed my brothers up for drum lessons. So What's, I didn't think that was very fair. But, uh, you know, life's not about being fair. I just, you know, I, I started practicing more and more and I'm the one who... I just stayed with it. You know, everyone kind of fell away from it and it stayed with me. And so I've just been playing ever since. So your parents weren't trying to, they were just basically trying to take advantage of the fact that there was now a drum set in them. Yeah. And I think they kind of sensed that I was just naturally good at it. Like I, I'm self-taught the whole way. Yeah. And um, I didn't need lessons, I guess. I mean, I get, it probably wouldn't have hurt to be honest. Um, yeah. I'm not a very great player. Um, I'm more of a pocket drummer. You know, some of those guys, some of the other bears out there, like Hoodley, Battle Bear, you know, he's got chops. Uh, Tempo Bear, he's got chops. I'm just more of a pocket drummer, you know. But I enjoy it. You know, in my, in my gigging career, I had to play with a lot of different drummers. And I would take a guy who can groove over a, over a chops guy any day. I'm with you, Joe. You're, get more work um you you know if you're if you're looking for work yeah so <laughs> all of that flash you know hoodley daddle is a great technical drum, and he grew but when you can find a guy who can do both that's that's rare and it's really valuable yeah, you, yeah there's, totally there's a lot of skill in just keeping just keep it in your pocket your, yeah. i want to get your thoughts on usually when this is about the technique it's because he doesn't really um value groove as much as someone. what what do you think about that mr uh say say that again if a guy is is obsessed with playing like neil pert we've talked a lot about a lot, a lot about this behind the scenes if a guy's obsessed with trying to be able to play technically really flashy stuff their focus is groove generally yeah, I think it's important, like, if you can really keep a good groove and then every once in a while, like, put in a little tasteful thing that is hard to do, that's, that's like, the best of both worlds. And because it allows the other instruments, which everybody forgets that, you know, uh, guitar, piano, everything else is also rhythmic, you know, so it's there's um, there's room for that. And when, they're, when a drummer is doing too much, it, it kind of, you know, there's not as much room to participate rhythmically as another instrument, if that makes sense. Right. Anthony Capolito has played to the song, which is absolutely right. Flocal bears chops only show during the drum solo, and that's when you go to the concession stand for a break. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's get Anthony in here. If he can join, we talked about it. I hope he can join. He's got funny Wi-Fi as well, but we'll see. All right, we got we got all four of us on here. Okay, Anthony Capolino. He played uh, guitar in a bunch of festivals. Uh, great guitar. He's been looking. Hey guys. How's that fun? Yeah, hey man. <laughs> Anthony, you just had a you just had a song come out, right? Recently? Yeah, I did. Uh, called Silver It's on all all the platforms. I did on YouTube. Top. We're gonna we gotta, hold on a second. We gotta we gotta have a we gotta have a special meeting here. 
Spool Bear, can you mute yourself when you're not talking? Because your kids are not going to hear anybody else's voice. Okay. Thanks. Don't leave. Just, yeah. And then when you want to say something, just uh, unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Say all that again, Anthony. Sorry. Yeah. We're on all the uh, all the streaming platforms, and you can find it on YouTube topics it's just, uh, just under nick and the nats it's my band name so yeah brand new song tell everybody how to spell that because i it's just in case yeah so it's nick and then the symbol sign for n you know n and then knacks like the band the knack from the 80s with a k right knacks yeah yeah nice it's not that straightforward. Yeah, there you go. But it's kind of intuitive, but yeah. And what's the new song? Tell us about the new song. Uh, it's called Silver Lining, and it's just kind of like uh, about having hope and finding hope within, uh, you know, a situation that's maybe not, like maybe you're not in a good situation, but there's, there's always light on the other side. Right. Uh, the idea of the song. I had a bunch of friends. Yeah. Who wrote it? Hmm? Who wrote it? Uh, I did with uh, with Nick. Um, I, I helped kind of co-wrote, write some of the lyric stuff, but I did all the music. Um, played uh, all the guitar parts, some synth, uh, bass guitar. Um, uh, most of the music, uh, I've got a really great drummer that I used. He's at, actually out of New Mexico, this guy, Caleb. Yeah. We, you, you and I have used Caleb. Yeah. Yeah, I guess this is a good, as good a time as any to talk about the ill fit Bear project. <laughs> yeah. We, we, uh, we started... I had this idea of remaking Freebird by Leonard Skinner into Free Bear, and I wrote some lyrics, and I started enlisting all these bears to come and play on it, which worked out great. Anthony uh, came up with the drummer, and you found a bass player. And so Caleb, the, the aforementioned Caleb here in New Mexico, recorded the drum track along with the original track. So the the timing, the, the feel, the tempo, all the varying that happened on the original, we matched that you know measure for measure. Uh, and we did the whole same length song as well. Uh, Anchor Bear sang it, and he did a wonderful, beautiful job on it. He didn't like a couple of my lyrics. He said they were gay, so he changed them. Uh, Anthony and I played a ton of guitar all over it. You found a bass player on, on online. Did you go to Gig or somewhere where you just go find a bass player online? Uh, uh, Flyboard Bear pointed me out to – or hit okay. me this person it was somebody that he used before and i think it was just off somebody off fiber and he fiber yeah that yeah. guy did a fantastic job everybody did a great job it's kind of uh in limbo in mix world uh devin flyboard bear is uh mixing it for us and we're you know kind of in a revision state we're just kind of like in final comments and notes and it's been uh you know it's been a little bit in limbo and it's all my fault and uh we're going to get back to it soon i hope no i listened i listened to it recently and i like man this it really it kicks man it grooves and the whole idea of of, of us kind of staying true to the original and, and kind of following the original recording is funny because i asked caleb the guy that played the drums i said well how did you do it you know with that because we had all the instruments there he's yeah. like man, I just pretended that i was in leonard skinner and uh, <laughs> Yeah, he really. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was funny, kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and we, so we did get to play it live at the festival. Um, Music Bear played keyboard on it, and he was having a blast. The video evidence is in. He was having a blast. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a good. It was a great time. I can't wait to hear the recording. It's. It'll be out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing about the festival, uh, last year, I wrote a big a big thing to Owen. It was before the one-page rule, but I, I wrote out this letter to Owen that just basically credited all the musicians and the crew from the festival, and I keep meaning to do that, to do that this year. So it's going to be a little late, but there'll be a letter to Owen that kind of lists everybody that played and 
hopefully I can make it a little bit funny and stuff and put a little money in there and make them read it. But uh, so anyway, that's that's coming. I just wanted everybody to know that's still coming. Awesome. Look forward to it. I got more questions for Spool Bear. How many kids do you have there now uh, in front of you? Uh, in front of me, just two. Cool. I got four total, though. <laughs> That's great. How old are they? Uh, this one's three. Nova's five. Six. You're six now? Yeah, six. Nova's six. <laughs> uh, Joe's is ten. And my youngest, uh, Ragnar, he will turn one in February. Great. I'm I'm the oldest of five, so I'm a big fan of big uh, big families. I love I loved growing up with four siblings. It was a blast, and I think more people should experience it. My sons don't have any kids yet, and I'm I'm hoping that I'm going to be a grandfather sometime. I found out my sister, my my siblings have not had any grandkids until uh, two weeks ago. My sister, my youngest sister, her daughter. So we're finally going to have some grandkids in my family yeah to my wife's horror i keep pushing for twins Ooh. so pray for her <laughs> yeah there you go that's cool uh have you guys i mean it's pretty far out but i just was curious have you made plans how you're going to get to the festival are you gonna drive down uh so far the working plan um we're going to drive all together and ideally, we'd like to um, do a little tour on the way down. Yeah. So we want to pick like three, four cities sure. and shoot for each one of those each night and have a show booked uh, just to kind of, you know, keep warm, you know, keep up to date on our uh, songs. Yeah. And uh, maybe make a little money on the way down to pay for the trip. Nice. Is there a work for jam bands to get you lined up with venue yeah you know once people find out that we do play reggae they freak out and they want to book us instantly um especially in north idaho no one no one does it up here and we don't exclusively do reggae uh, you know we have like maybe three four reggae tunes that we play yeah um out of our two hours set um but people do like it and so i think you know, I think jam bands are kind of making a comeback. You know, you got the jam crews over here, and uh, yeah, people people seem to like it. So cool. I think we'll have no problem, especially because we're planning on going to Arizona next year and recording an album. Awesome. Uh, just because that's where my guitar player's engineer lives, and he's got a studio. Yeah. Uh, so we're hoping to actually have an album cut next year uh, to kind of promote our work. That's awesome. Nice. We we used to do, brother and I had our, you know, our brother's band, and we were a bar band. We mostly did blues rock, but we would throw in a couple of reggae songs. We actually had to stop doing that because the, um, all of the Rasta people in the crowd, once you play one reggae song, they'll just keep coming up all night asking you to do more of them, and we just finally had to stop. We couldn't tease them like that. Yeah, I see Trident Bear asked, uh, how does everyone like stick figure? And uh, I was never really into reggae when we started. And stick figure was the band my guys told me to listen to. And, uh, and so I spent you know a week in the truck just listening to them and trying to learn how to play reggae drums. So Yeah, I like how different the reggae drums are from uh, any other style. There's like a, it's almost like backwards in a way. Oh, it's inside out, yeah. yeah. So it's the one and the three, yeah. We've, we've reached that point where nobody's talking. That's great. <laughs> Bull Bear, I'm going to I'm gonna cycle you out and bring Grungy, Grungy Blues Bear in. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate right it. Right on, Joe. Thanks for having me. It was nice talking to you guys. Yeah. We'll nice see. to meet you, man. Yeah. yeah. Right on. All right. Good night, you guys. Thank you. Daddy, I'm going to the blue eyes. Anthony. Yeah. What's your experience with playing reggae in clubs? Uh, no, zero. <laughs> really? No. No. I'm not. 
Yeah, I'm not a reggae player at all. I could probably fake it. I've never, I've never done it though. Played country, played gospel, played just about everything but. <laughs> Do you ever play it by yourself at your house? Reggae? No, <laughs> you know, I've just, I don't know. I never, I, did, I never bonded with with reggae. No. Somehow that doesn't surprise me that much. <laughs> what about you, Music Bear? Um, I haven't really played it live. Uh, I'd say there's probably some reggae influence in the music that I make, uh, but it's not straight reggae. It's, you know, I do use that um, sort of uh, the ands, like one and two and like I do that sort of thing, but like with a synth and um, I loved I love dub and reggae music, um, but yeah, I've never played it live. If I did play it live, I'd want to play bass. Yeah. Trying to get grungy in here. We'll see how that works. I was already uh, playing guitar when reggae kind of infiltrated American rock radio in 72, 73. There were a couple of songs that all came around at the same time. Um, Paul Simon was experimenting with, you know, all kinds of indigenous rhythms and stuff. I forget. Uh, he had a couple of songs that had a lot of reggae influence right about that time, 72. And uh, I can see clearly now was considered a reggae song, even though it didn't have that backwards reggae beat it had had that kind of caribbean feel which kind of opened the door for reggae and then the the, the movie the harder they come the harder they come came out and it was kind of an indie film uh but the soundtrack was just phenomenal and a lot of the songs on that movie it was just shot down it was very low budget movie filmed in jamaica and um the soundtrack came out and the soundtrack had a bunch of radio hits on it. Um, By the Rivers of Babylon was on there. Uh, Johnny Too Bad was on there. Um, Harder They Come itself, the, the title track was a, was a hit. So reggae just like was everywhere. By 73, it really was everywhere, it, you know. So, and I really liked it at the time. I, I remember thinking, wow, am I going to have to like, stop being a rocker if i'm gonna play this i had like this almost like this crisis like should i do i do i just go into this now or or what but i i couldn't do that it's almost yeah. it's 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 something really difficult i would think to perform it and be like you've got to be your heart has got to be it's got to be genuine you know it's kind of like we've talked about joe you you and i have talked about bands that play uh Stevie Wonder super, superstitious. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And it just sounds so just white cracker, just <laughs> cracker. You know? <laughs> it's, it's just rigid, you know. Like uh I would think you would really have to immerse yourself yeah. in that. I enjoy some reggae songs and I think like um some of the stuff that um Owen oh, is play like the uh, redemption song. I love that song, and yeah. uh, you know some of some of the Bob Marley stuff. Uh, but outside of those few little things, I don't, I don't really know a whole lot. I think of uh, Jamaica by Led Zeppelin, and I, I looked it up. It's like right when you were talking about seventy two, seventy three. Uh, but yeah, it came out on Houses of the Holy in seventy three. When did Clapton come out with that? When was I shot the sheriff? Was that uh, later? 74, 75. Okay, so that's not after that. I think everybody kind of got that, that bug, that reggae bug, like this is the new thing. Right. And I shot the sheriff was just kind of a shitty song. I mean, just even think about the, the, Im the you know, the image that it, that was on a Bob Marley record, I think, before he recorded. It was already a, the the reggae guys were crazy because if one guy had a version of a song and it got it was, became a hit in Jamaica, all the guys would record that song. So pretty much 
you can, you know, any real traditional reggae song, you could hear it by 10 different bands because they all just did all the same songs. It's crazy. And that's what Clapton picked up on. I think Clapton went through a really shitty period um, after he got off heroin. Uh, you get on the... He just made a lot of lackluster. I, th I think Cocaine is the worst fucking song ever recorded. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. It's yeah. awful. It's terrible. I'm not, that, that whole J.J. Kale, weird. He was kind of trying to find himself. I think he was kind of looking to, to, to other people for inspiration and kind of trying to, right. to find himself. Because it was like he had what he did, the John Mayles, right? A blue, blues bait breaker record and then when the cream came right after that right yep like a relatively really short window and then you got um well blind faith was right after that uh, and blind, blind year. Faith. okay and then derek and the dominoes was right yeah. after that and that lasted yeah. only two years which was so what i mean it's crazy you know uh amount of music and yeah. and, and and so vastly different in a short amount of time yeah i'm gonna bring trident bear in here uh grungy i think you should go and uninstall instagram and reinstall it because i've tried to bring grungy in 10 times and it's just not working yeah i do it dude that that happened to me Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Eric Clapton also had trouble with a different shot as well, a more recent shot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah he, but then he went and got then he then he went and got round two after that. He's an idiot. He's just an he's just a he's just brain dead. Uh, I have a you know, being my age, being a boomer and everything, I have so much respect for Clapton. Uh, of course I studied him religiously. You know, I, I studied Clapton more than probably any other any other guitar player in my first five years of playing. You know, and so that influence is is evident in my in my playing. Uh, yeah, it was so much in our household. My dad was just a huge music fan, and we had he had a great record collection, and he knew, we knew everything. You know, somehow, well, we had a subscription to Rolling Stone magazine, so we knew everything that Clapton did because they write about it almost every week. I think it came out every, every week, every month. I don't know. Anyway, every guitar player magazine now, <laughs> it's like, right. like the three, the greatest. And it's always, they're always stroking Clapton and Hendrix and yeah. Right. Yeah. Spool Bear says white room is a jam. I love that song. Yeah. Yeah. Grungy Blues Bear says cocaine is a great song. It's two chords and it's got a really shitty message. It, there's no, there's nothing there. There is nothing. Even the solos on it suck. I mean, I was only in one band that ever did it, and I would try to complain like, let's not do that song. It's because we had we had a lot of other great songs, you know, whatever. <laughs> what record was it on, Joe? Do you remember? Was that the something Ocean Boulevard? Or or 461 Ocean Boulevard or the one right after that. Yeah, something. It, like, that was his lazy period. That, that was his... Uh... Uh, he was, yeah, he was just trying to get by, you know. A lot of people don't uh, know this if they weren't really paying attention back then or they don't know the history, but the band put out a record that everybody wanted to be the band. Like all the famous bands... The band was like living in a house in upstate New York or somewhere in New York, like rural. And they put out a record called The Band. And Time Magazine put them on the cover in 68 or 69 when that record came out. And it was such great music and it was so organic because it was just a bunch of guys playing in a room. And all the other bands wanted to be the band. And that, that influenced Clapton. He was trying to get back to like that real, just that real authentic playing with other people kind of thing and uh i think that was a big influence on him as well do you think that 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 was that kind of uh americana influence i know that a lot of those guys were canadian they were yeah they were two, at least two of them were <laughs> yeah they come from canada i know leave uh helm what's his name the drummer Levin helm? Levin helm? Yeah. yeah well he was american i know he uh, right. but it was yeah. the other guy robbie uh 
what's his name? The one that just passed away. I know he was Robbie there. Robertson, yeah. Robbie Robertson. I think there's this fascination with American culture and song and, and music because there's so much rich heritage that goes back, you know, even, you know, you got the blues, then you have that kind of mountain music like the Carters, you know. Yep. And uh, uh, I think they're um, – it was almost it was like a, a mythical kind of thing that they were trying to hone, like hone in on and kind of, uh, you know, make it something, uh, you know, rebrand it, make it something new, like draw inspiration from it. I think you're totally right though, on the, like um, uh, with Clapton uh, being so inspired by that. Yeah. As much as I don't want to like um, Ken Ken Burns, his music series were the country music series was great. I don't know if you guys got to see that that documentary series. And of course, he couldn't help he couldn't help himself putting in all this social justice bullshit in it. And you know, he had to make sure and say, oh yeah, well we had our Hispanic Freddie Fender and we had our, he did like a whole thing on Freddie Fender. It was like, he had to, you know, it was like, um, you know, just like trying to give equal time to everybody. But, you know, Charlie Rich and Freddie Fender were just a real minor footnote in country music history. Freddie Fender had a few big hits. So did Char Charlie Rich was the first black country guy. And, you know, they weren't, they were big for a little while, but they weren't key to the history of the music the way the way the real people were. Joe, you were talking about how um, Eric Clapton was trying to get back to like that more authentic playing with other people sort yeah. of thing. And that kind of reminded me of some of the things that we were, t we've been talking about, especially just in this modern world where everybody has a home studio and everybody can just write their own stuff and play their own stuff with each other or use loops or whatever it is. It's yeah. so like a lot of that magic has been lost when it extends not just like with players, but also the um, the record making process, right? Like we were listening to that um, to that podcast with uh, Jack Joseph uh, Puig and and uh, yeah, that that big budget or well, just not even big budget, but like multiple teams, you know, putting their their specialties all together to create something bigger than just like one person can make has in many ways been lost uh, in modern music. And I thought that, you know, was it kind of an interesting thing? There's something just magical about when you get a bunch of people in a room playing, and it's usually guys, you get a bunch of guys playing together in a room uh, that have been playing together for a while, whether it's whether they're a road band and they're just really good and they go in the studio, or if it's like the Wrecking Crew or the Muscle Shoals crew, uh, those guys, they would they would just go to their job every day, and it was like being in the studio for twelve hours a day, just cranking out hits. That music has a certain feel. There's a certain pocket to the rhythm. There's a certain uh, dynamic to it that's just in Motown. You know, the, there's a humanity to it. There's a humanity to it. We've everything has become so homogenized with just the way everything sounds sonically. You know. We listen to stuff that so we compress everything down to so, you know, much. It's just, um, but there, there is a total. There is a magic that happens, like you were saying, um, when when you get some guys in a, in a room that are, you know, it's like every, and we everybody has a different experience. Everybody comes from a different walk of life, and when you bring them together in there and and uh there's a connection there and that and it it, it ignites you know then you like and you get something like you know but when you look back at bands past you know like the who or aerosmith or something mm -hmm. i don't you know it, it's uh um or just kids like kids playing playing together you know yeah. i like i'm sure you, i'm I know that you, uh, everybody here has had that experience of like the first time that you get in a room with other guys and you kind of really don't know what you're doing. And, uh, but it's exciting and, and, 
and you make a sound and you make a noise and you crank something out and you maybe play, you know, uh, one or two songs that you know like five times, but it's it's it, it's magical and kids they don't you know it's uh, it's lost, but it's on. I think it's it's still upon us as music creators, right? To put we can put humanity in the music. It's right. just we have to be more cog. We have to be cognitive of that when we're, you know, when we're, when we're doing it, you know, and try to, uh, because the tools that we have, it's great. It's, it's great to have what we have and uh, not be limited to, you know, just the big studios where you'd have to spend a whole lot of money and a lot of time. And it might even not even be anywhere close to the vision that you had, the original vision that you had in your mind. But I think, um, it's all about it's up to us ultimately to put the uh to try to put that stamp of you know humanity in the music you know yeah it's like a there's like a double-edged sword with the technology and now that um i think I, I was just watching a video about ableton live and uh or ableton live 12 and a lot of their um sort of sequencing tools have evolved to the point where they're kind of marketing it as something that can create that human feel a lot easier. And they've uh, put in a lot of tools like that. I haven't played around with it yet, um, but I'm looking forward to it. I mean, just being able to play with different swing grids and easily humanize things and, and whatnot. So it's, it's interesting that there's, you know, that sort of double edged nature to the technology. Well, yeah, uh, you know, Music Bear, both you guys know from our behind the scenes conversations where I stand on all this. I, I, I'm, I don't want to be a slave to quantized music. And I believe that, I believe that um, the public isn't as unforgiving as some people like to think. I think that people are actually craving imperfection. And I, and I want to be, uh, I want to kind of bring them, bring them some of that. Uh, it's I got to stop. The, oh, we, we go. I want to hear both your guys' thoughts on that, but uh, I got to make a public service announcement. This, this thing is broken. Instagram is broken. It's not letting me bring anybody else on. I've tried over and over and over again, and I, I'm not going to keep pressing buttons because it's just it's not letting anybody else come on. So, Music Bear, at some point, we'll cycle you out and see if maybe Grungy can come on, and we'll try to keep going. Cool. But yeah, so. Yeah, I think Ableton, I think there are a lot of people trying to figure out how to put that humanness back in it. And I, I salute that. And I, I look forward to seeing how those solutions uh, bring bring that about. It's cool. Yeah, I mean, you and I were talking about um, sort of the different ways in which you can humanize something. And, um, you know, in, in our conversations, uh, I had mentioned that thinking about rhythm as imperfect is a lot easier for me to wrap my, uh, my personal brain around because um, just like growing up in choirs and trying to find that perfect blend and listening to the types of music I listen to, it's all about, you know, perfect tuning and auto tune and melodyne and, and whatever. And so uh, you've actually been pretty instrumental in helping me kind of reframe uh, my brain on that a little bit. And um, I, I got to send you the video. There's that stubborn. There's that King uh, King Gizzard and the something. We, I keep on forgetting to look it up. I'm gonna send you. There's a KEXP concert, but they're playing with microtonal guitars and um, and with you know. Speaking of that, like I'll see these Instagram videos where there's like a chart and the uh, Indian music scale. And they're like, they've got a pen and they're singing and they're playing around with that, that scale and then the in-betweens and kind of sliding in between tones. It's just super cool. And I think that that is starting to come more to the forefront in uh, like on music Instagram, for, for example. Well, and, and guitar players have been able to do it forever because there are a bunch of microtones in every bend. Yeah. And, and this pressure on guitar players, oh, your bends have to be in tune. And once you actually master being able to bend in tune to the 12 note system that we're used to, 
if you have that mastery of it, then if you want to mess around with it, you can do it with authority. It's one thing to be out of tune and just not even know you're out of tune. There's a whole other level beyond all of this where you're, you're so aware that you're able to actually mess with it and take the music to an emotional place that's, that's rare. Yeah, uh, Reeling in the Year is Steely Dan. Uh, I was listening to that the other day and there's a spot in the solo where he goes just a bit sharp on, on this bend and it makes it, you know, totally makes it. It's not exactly yeah. there, but it really like it. Yeah, I don't know. There's this, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it's a really, really good feeling when they when they hit that note. Right. Yeah. yeah. I gotta go back and listen to that. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and then- You know, it's the, funny though. It's like, <clears throat> you listen to older rock and roll and a after have been immersed into recording stuff and playing live with bands and you know it's like oh you're always checking your tuning you know you're always trying to make sure that you're as excellent as you can be and then you'll go and i'll go listen to you know you'll go put on old zeppelin and put on tangerine and it's like the guitar is so grossly out of tune it's like how did i miss that when i was you know like when you're coming to when you're coming up, listen to music. It's like, well, that's just the way it's supposed to sound, right? Or like, uh, uh, gosh, well, there was a Springsteen record. Somebody's playing, and I, I, I think it, it, it was on one of his. It may have been on Thunder Road or whatever. What, you know, the big one was, and it was like the guitar is so, like, grossly out of tune. But I guess like they they caught the. Uh, they caught the essence of it. They caught the vibe. They caught the energy it, enough to where it's like, I guess they were like, just, you know, fuck it. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. go with it, you know? And there's a, the, the human brain does a thing, and this is real something for people to keep in mind when they're creating, you know, a track or recording something or performing. Well, when, you, when you're listening back, by about the third mm -hmm. time you hear something, your mind just makes it normal. Yes. The fifth time, there's like, I don't know how many times, it's, there's some, it's kind of magic number in there somewhere. By the, you know, the third or the fifth time you've heard it, you don't hear it as out of tune anymore. So, you know, you're talking about Thunder Road. We've all heard it so many times that we'd actually have a hard time finding what you're talking about. I mean, well, maybe, I don't, if we're really, I don't know, whatever. But. Yeah, I mean, I've had a few experiences where I'll record a guitar solo and because I've had success maybe going in and fixing a couple things in Melodyne on other songs, I'll go in, I'll play around with it, and I, you know, look at the lines, and I'm listening, and I'm using a tuner, and I'm maybe trying to fix certain spots. I listen back, and it doesn't sound as good. And, um, mm. and so then I'll end up undoing a lot of it and, like, leaving a couple things here or there. But there's, yeah, I mean, there's really... Uh, you know what what we talk about i mean you're you're definitely right joe and and um it's like it can be like you use the word that it can be too sterile or too and too quantized and yeah i think there's there's a there's a happy medium right and and um it depends on the style right and yeah yeah style style matters a lot yeah that's a that's a really that's a really good uh point you brought up there this it, it does just depend on the style a lot yeah are you guys aware that uh, by the time Def Leppard was making uh porno what was it called Por uh, not porno graffiti you, you that's extreme you're thinking pyromania pyromania sorry yeah uh, yeah um they were recording all the guitar chords one note at a time for that record that, that sounds like Chinese water torture man <laughs> and it, it took them a year it took them a year to make that it was I think it was over a year to make that record and it sounds, you know, for that era and everything, it sounds fantastic, wonderful, beautiful, perfect. But that that's an extreme that people would go to. Uh, yeah, I just, I kind of long for, you know, hearing people just jam, you know. It's crazy, though, when they, you know, like on, um, what's the big photograph? If you yeah. listen to that, it's not, the pitch is not, um, you know, A440. It's, it's. It's like in between, 
it's it's like it, it's a, it's an in between pitch. It's weird, but I think it it happened a lot. You know, because when they're when they would bounce the tape, bouncing, bouncing, and all that. Yeah, slight was, voltage changes on the motors. Yeah, yeah. Speed up and you know, um, and you know, even uh, back in the day. You know, they would use the tape machines uh, to uh, um, to make the guys like to as like a trick, like a studio trick to make to get well, very yeah, very speed, very speed uh, altered, and yeah. So we've all, we've all you know technology changes, but we all, <laughs> sometimes we all you know we'll, we you know there's always been studio tricks and things, but. Um, it certainly it was a lot more limited um, to what they could do then as to can I, what available. Can what I tell you guys now. a boomer story? This this is uh, since the, this is we're very much on topic. I don't know how many of you people remember Carly Simon. She's saying you're so vain. I think that's dad, be about. Yeah. She was um, rel related to the. This is probably another Jew story. Uh, she was related to the Simon of Simon and Schuster. She didn't get famous because of anything other than her connections, just like everything else. And she was a really shitty singer, really sh ter terrible singer. And so they would, they would record her voice. And as I got more savvy, you know, you'd still hear You're So Vain on the radio for year, years after it was a hit. They had and I've never discussed this with anybody. I might have, whatever, but um, they had a trick for auto-tune that involved using the, the fader on the reverb. If they heard, if they heard a note that was in tune, they would crank the shit out of the reverb so that in tune note was like staying longer. Ah. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's interesting. And so it took a guy, it took a guy with, an incredibly good ear to ride that fader on the reverb to make her sound somewhat in tune. <laughs> the lengths that they go, wow, it's, it's wild. Yeah. I mean, I remember the whole, the first use of auto-tune is, uh, I believe, Cher. And I think the story was like, she's she was doing so poorly in her career that they needed to make her sound like a robot to, <laughs> to, uh, to kind of breathe some life back in. There was some that well, if you're talking about uh, if you believe in love from '98, is that what you're referring to? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like there. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was a, there was technology, you know, because Pro Tools is around, you know, from '92 or whatever. There was a lot of auto. There was some primitive auto tune stuff long before '98. That's proud when people talk about that. That's probably the first um, blatant use of it, where it's actually being used as an effect. Right. And for the first time that came on the radio, I thought to myself, "Oh, we're fucked. We're fucked." <laughs> it sounds it's such ear candy when you hear that that little that little glitch in the stair step, ooh, that little blurb, that little blurb, blurble in there. Yeah, the snap. Catch you to the ear. It's it's like bubble gum for your ear. It's ear candy. And I realized that's it everything's going to be everybody's going to be doing this shit for the next 30 years and and it was a perfect prediction i think, it, it, it I think we'll back around though i i, I kind of see things swinging the uh, like um especially like in the rock world i'm i'm seeing more kind of like more org organic kind of uh that kind of 70s kind of ballsy right well, and that, and even in 98, when they used it on her voice pitch, it had the sound very similar to a vocoder, which had been done in the 70s by Parliament Funkadelic and a bunch of those other bands. So vocoder was the forerunner to that, and it had that same kind of stair-steppy sound to it. Trident's talking about Talkbox. Talkbox is cool. Yeah, that's not related to what we're talking about, but yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it's in that same vocal pitch type, you know, category, it, I would it's say. Not, it's, a, it's a whole different... It's not the same thing, but it's it does like make sort of a a locked in pitch um, type vocal effect. But yeah, Trident Bear was just talking about it in the chat. Yeah, I guess I guess um, it's it's similar in the way that a rhinoceros is similar to a hummingbird or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being, 
I'm being I'm being a dick. Hey, yeah, the things I'm talking about with pitch correction, auto tune, and vocoder, it's just a slightly different realm. It's fine. Is that your talk box? My talk box, man. Oh, you've got one. Nice to go. Good. Yeah, now try to bear thinks I'm out to get him. No, the talk boxes are great. Uh, I don't like them for several reasons. I don't like uh, the drool factor. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true. I, I got, never. I got a. Uh, I went and bought a black tube. Because the you know the tubes that come with them are just so like the clear, like yeah. after all, they just look disgusting, you know. Um, that's right. But that that's like the most old school tech uh, archaic technology ever. Is all it is is just a speaker enclosure, you know. So right. what you do, you just you're you're moving the signal of the guitar fr from the uh, from the speaker cabinet from the guitar speaker cabinet to that little speaker box, right? What? And so play the, you, you guys know all this. <laughs> it's, it's weird to try. It's weird to try to do it because. You have to still provide consonants, but you you can't make a like a. You have to shape your mouth like the vowel, provide the consonants, but not actually sing. It's so weird. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Cucumber, I cannot kick Spool Bear out because he's not showing up on my list. As everybody's trying to to be Mr. Helper over here, I appreciate it. Uh, maybe we will cycle Music Bear out. Uh, it's great to have you. Well, I'll yeah, see it's if, been a pleasure. I'll see if I'll see if I can get Grungy and all the other people on here after we get. I don't know. Cool. This this happens with Instagram sometimes. It's been great to have you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, yeah we'll see. talk soon. Good to see you, Anthony. Okay, now let's try this crazy thing. Yeah. <laughs> broken it's but and what yeah oh there okay so now it's working okay they used to let us have four now we can only have three what's, what's up jess now you're now you're real sorry i was finishing the sandwich bite there um but yeah joe i knew you had it out for me buddy <laughs> i know uh i'm not really a pocket player i'm more like a t-shirt pocket player um, but, uh, I'm still trying to play a different strum pattern these days. How do you get off the same strumming pattern? Like, you know, going back to the reggae thing, my, my influence is so strong in reggae and blues. I just can't get past that one too. Um, but I'm still practicing. Uh, get a guitar teacher. Yeah. You know what I've thought about? And this is something I really want to do. I was talking with my son. I want to go to a um, a guitar teacher and totally play it like I've never played before. So I don't give him an idea of what I can and can't do. Interesting. Kind of go, look, man, I want to start from the beginning and just literally act like a brand new student and then just go through from ABC. What do you think? <laughs> Great. That's a great plan. Uh, Anthony, have you ever tried this where you actually pick up the guitar and pretend you don't know how to play? Uh, I haven't. Not yet. <laughs> it's, it's, it took it's, him so long to play. Why would he do that? <laughs> no, it's... Uh, well, I guess you could try to play left hand. I could try to play left-handed. Yeah. Well, would, it's even... It's, even um, it's got a function if you do it with your regular orientation because it 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 just takes your mind somewhere. It's very related to what Trident is saying. Um, I like what I like where you're going with that because you're recognizing that you're kind of locked into something and you want to light a bomb under it and blow it up. Uh, a good teacher will help you, or you could just uh, there's there's a lot of different ways to try it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just it's not you just you got to put in the time and don't be lazy and. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just too lazy. I. Too uh, Music uh, had a great suggestion. She, she said, try songs in 6-8. She's a music teacher as well. So Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah just go to, a, go to a completely different genre than you've, than you've been used to. Mm -hmm. um, well, it, it helps, too, when you learn your instrument. 
you know, I mean, I'll be honest, I've fumbled my way through it for so long, but I don't know what I'm playing. You know, I don't know what each fret means. You know, where everything starts, I just, everything is by ear and what sounds good. Right. And, uh, and I know patterns, I'm really good with patterns. So I'm like, no, no, that's the same pattern, change it up. Right. And then you're kind of at the limit of what your hand can do. And then the right hand gets kind of spazzy every now and then. Um, so there's really something to be said for knowing enough theory to know what, I mean, it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier. You have to know what's right before you can start breaking the rules. Mm. Um, it's great to be able to play from feel and be able to learn a bunch of stuff by ear. But at some point, everybody has to, if they really want to take it to the next level, they have to commit to learning how not to play the wrong notes. Right, right. And then in the top of that, my father was my father was a professional musician. He uh, he was like a 50s kind of 50s cover band guy down here in San Diego and uh, did like rock. And he jammed with uh, with Miles Davis and uh, and Chuck Berry a couple times. Wow. Um, and uh, and he was a really my father was a really good musician. He's a bass player. And to what you were saying about knowing the right notes. I'm always thinking of what he told me about learning the gaps between the notes versus the notes. I was always trying to play too many notes and he's like, no, it's the space in between the notes right. instead of the notes themselves. Um, and I just, I try to. That's actually more of a timing thing than a note choice thing. But yeah, I know what you, yeah. Right, but just to add to what you were saying there. What do you say, Anthony? I, you know, when, when I get up on stage and when, performing like uh if you're getting up and you haven't performed with anyone you, you you've got uh, you know you you have enough knowledge to be able to to be able to hang right but then once you get into it, it's like you're in the heat of the battle and like all of that just goes out out the window and it's like all the preparation and everything you learned all leading up into that point that's when it kick, kind of kicks in and you and, and you're kind of like I'm kind of rolling uh, subconscious, you know, I'm just kind of uh, feeling it. It's, you know, putting in it, you know how it, it's like, it's putting in all those hours. It's almost like an athlete, right? Like I'm, I've never been an athlete or never really played sports, but, you know, putting in all that time and preparation, like you preparing to run a race, it's the same thing with, with your. Yeah. Head. It's with, definitely like uh very similar to like, muay thai and martial arts like we could do all the training but second the bell rings and you got that opponent across from you all that practice kind of goes out the window on what your plan was um but in a song you have to stay on the song right so you can't uh yeah so ahead. you want to know you know at least know the form right no or no well and that's the cover music we play cover music a lot so it's like you know we know you know uh, the song structures and then you got certain there's certain points when you can kind of uh, cut loose of that a little bit and kind of uh, you know improvise and try and try new things and like, have you guys ever met like go the for musician that the musician that plays so many covers that he doesn't know his own music and what exactly is going on do you think mentally that someone you know they're they're so good at everyone else's songs but they just can't play their own songs what do you think's going on there play their own music like as in, yeah like as just their own stuff like literally just come up they would like rather spend they, their time learning covers than making their own music i don't know man it's like they uh it's they've they've become that <laughs> yeah yeah dollar bills y'all right it's it's there, it's kind of there is a there is a lot of that though but that's a poor, that's a muscle in the brain you, you really have to flex and develop just like you spend the time to get better at like i spend the time to get better at guitar you have to spend the time to get better at writing songs and a lot of people are afraid to do something that sucks you know it's like the 
the stuff, the first stuff that you're going to put out is not going to be good, you know? And it's like, you got to get all that crap out. You got to write a hundred songs to get something that's, that's half decent. And after you do that, or you get something that's half decent, you got to be willing to tweak and tweak and massage and refine and get it to where it's, you know, perfect. And being open to like passing it along, like, Hey Joe, I've got something. Can you mind listening to this? And yeah. Like be able to take a um, uh, constructive criticism and kind of uh, uh, be able to go back to the drawing board and kind of put it back out. But it's like I think it's a whole different. It's a different muscle that if you hadn't really worked it, then it's. I I think that's maybe what that is. I think some people. Yeah, you've you've kind of hit a good point there. Um, you get addicted to going over well. Like if you start playing publicly at a young age or you have like early success and you're getting paid to play covers, there's this incentive to keep doing that because you don't want to actually take a step backward because you're actually going to lose some momentum if you try to present your own music uh, and, uh. and it's not as good as the covers that you're covering. Uh, a really great song, there's a lot to it. Like. Anthony was saying, I think a lot of the songs that we consider great throughout history were probably halfway shitty when the band brought them into the studio. The record company made the made the people hire a really good producer and a really great producer a lot of times will be a good arranger. So he'll say, why are you, he'll listen to the song and he'll say, why are you like, why are you repeating that thing right before you're going to the chorus? You shouldn't be just repeating something from the verse. You should be setting up the chorus. Like there are these simple rules. It's almost mathematical uh, to make it catchy. It's funny you said that. I just want to piggyback on what you're saying. That I, yeah. I watched an interview with, I forgot his name, Bo something or other. He did, he produced Rat. And right. when they originally walked, came in with Round and Round, they wanted to have a pause before they, it was like, you know, instead of like going into it, round and round, it, it's like they would have a break and then round and round. But they had played it so long in rehearsal one way. They're like, no, this is the way it's got to be. And the guy put his foot down. It's like, no, you got to change it. And they did. And it became a. a was it was his argument that it was breaking up the flow of the song? Yeah, it was like it was it was breaking up the flow. of the song. It didn't make any sense. Right. It was. But it was like, you know, we were talking about about earlier. It's like when you record something or you're working on something and you hear it, you've heard it back so many times, it it your ear is trained to think like, okay, well, it it, it, it accepts it, right? right? Even if it may be a bad idea, you know, so. Yep. Um, yeah, there's another example. Um, you know, Grand Funk Railroad had already had two or three albums that did fairly well kind of regionally in the midwest or whatever they and i forget what record label they were on but for their third or fourth record the i think that they were on abc dunhill um the, the record company made them get todd rundgren to produce the third record and they had not had a big radio hit prior to this they had some stuff on the radio but their first big major hit was american band we're an american band you know that and Throughout the chorus, there's that eighth note piano thing going, and they hated it. Todd Rundgren wanted to put that in there, but he said because that's going to drive the chorus. And Rundgren was already, you know, very accomplished at that point. They they tried to fight him tooth and nail, not to have that that piano figure in the chorus because it wasn't. They, to them, it sounded like bubble gum. It wasn't like the grand funk, you know, hard driving rock thing that they wanted to do. But they lost the argument because ultimately Rundgren had the power that stayed in there. And they had a huge number one radio hit with that. Um, I don't know. I don't know who the winner of that was, except uh, we now have a song and a story about it. Man, I, I love that in rock and roll with the, the little. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Like it, 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 it makes that, that, that's really cool. I've got to go back and listen to that one too. Really lifts it up. There's another story about Bachman Turner Overdrive, the piano player on, um, 
I think it was taking care of business. Is there a piano solo on taking care of business? Uh, there, I mean, I can hear the piano in the song, but I, I, I can't. There's one of their big, big hits. Uh, they were working in the studio late it was right. wasn't really coming together blah 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 or whatever it was just they were trying to get this thing going and uh they decided to stop and order a pizza and the he uh, randy bachman told this story on the dennis miller radio show years ago so i've actually heard this from randy bachman's mouth the pizza delivery guy shows up with the pizzas and uh he brings it in and they're, they're listening to it he goes hey that sounds pretty good i'm a piano player can i have a can i have a crack at it <laughs> and they you know, it was kind of against the rules, but they were, I don't know, they just kind of like figured out what the hell, give, give the guy a shot. And he went and did this incredible solo and uh, got credited on the record. And that was, he went from being a pizza delivery driver. He ended up becoming Bette Midler's music director. He had a whole career in music after that, just by speaking up when he brought the pizzas, like, hey, let me, let me try this. Take that chance. That's yeah. Awesome. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, because uh, Joe knows that I'm a big Crow fan, and uh, and Jason and Crow are musicians as well. Black Crows? Uh, who's that? Crow Joe. He's been, he's been a bad joke. <laughs> oh, did you say Christopher Cross? No. He oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes. he's always talking about Tavistock, right? And mm -hmm. Theodore Adorno, specifically. Yep. and how he was responsible now when he's saying he was adorno was responsible like does he mean that he was behind apple records or he he wrote the music for the bands i mean how do you guys know much about that in adorno i i think i'm assuming yeah. there's a lot of co ghost writing going on with a lot of these bands because I, I like especially like you think of the stones oh just on heroin and drugged out like how, like how are they cranking out all this material you know mm -hmm. uh so I, i'm imagining there's a lot of ghost writing that's going on just for, like there is today you know well that kind of takes me to my next part of that question and again i've asked joe before and it looks like you've discovered him since we talked about it but i'm so caught up on greta van fleet man um these guys are so young and i just think they're too good I mean, they're so tight. I just, I can't help but think, is there someone behind their music? Um, and, and just how well they capture that Zeppelin, like old school sound. I mean, even all the, just the little in-between notes and the little things with his voice, man, I just, I can't stop listening to him. I just love him. Yeah, my younger son really was in a big Greta Van Vliet fan when they first hit the big time. I think it's kind of true that anybody that's on the main stage is somewhat, you know, part of the system, if we want to call it that. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm even more of a fan of um, Mike Williams, Sage of Quay, than I am Crow. And he's had guests on there that explain all these connections between, you know, the, the oligarchy, you know, Tavistock, all this uh Adorno that you were talking about, the Beatles, but the Stones were were propped up there like yeah. Um The Dead. The Dead <laughs> The Dead is so tied in with Silicon Valley, it's not even funny. Like it, who's the uh who's, Frank Zappa? Who's the guitar player in the dead? The um uh Jerry not, Garcia. Not Garcia, the other Bob guy. uh Weir. Bob Weir. Do you know he I, I he's a member of Bohemian Grove. No way! Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just, that's. Yeah. Those guys are all. Yeah. It's got to be. It's all well. Owen is even talked. Owen's talked about this. He was like, all these musicians, like a lot of their parents were all um, in uh, high-ranking military. That's right. You mm -hmm. know, so and, and and a lot of that, like I was reading Keith's book, uh, Keith Richards' book. And they they talk about it how like uh, the the creation of the whole record company thing was almost it was like a write off for it for for the military and all these so they're they're uh, I don't know what I'm 
I just lost my train of thought, but um, no, it's all it all it all makes sense. It's all connected. It's all. I mean, you they would do this thing where they would send an American over to England to make him famous here, and vice versa. Yes, it happened a bunch of times. You know, Elton John was basically getting no traction in England, so they sent him to L.A. and his first night at the Troubadour Club in in L.A. And that's all tied in with Thorough Canyon and Charles Manson and all that stuff. You know, the Eagles, Linda Ronstadt, all that West Coast stuff. Uh, the first night Elton John played at the Troubadour Club in in L.A. after he'd been trying in England for a couple of years, he was an, uh, an international star just from that one night of playing at the Troubadour Club. That was all set up in advance. That was all orchestrated, calculated. I mean, it's a business. Yeah. It, it's a business. They know what they're doing. They're, it's not... Uh... It's not it, it's not some willy nilly thing like, uh, hey guys, let's get together and write all these great songs and everything. It's it's I, I don't believe that at all. I I, be, I believe there's a lot of stuff that starts that you know you, you can start out that way organically because I did certainly did and I, I know you did as well, Joe. Getting together and playing music, but as far as like having some massive success and stuff, it's like. I don't know. I've been around enough of it to where I've seen it, uh, kind of seen a little peek, got to peek a little bit, but behind the curtain, and it's like it's, you know, you you have to, you you have to kiss the ring to get to a certain level and mm. to be uh, to be to have any sort to be to have any sort of success, and then you have to well, go along yeah with the day, whatever I, the agenda is. Some bears know this. Uh, I don't really talk about it that much, but I have a, I have a very long-standing connection to the music industry from a pretty high level because my, my younger brother, <laughs> it, has played on a bunch of you know he's been the music director and bass player of a Grammy and uh, you know Grammy nominated multi multi platinum and gold record act you know ten record deal with Sony. And <laughs> So I've seen I've seen what they went through to do what they do, and it it messed up his mind. I mean, he's he's a total social justice warrior. He's um, he's a slave to to the thinking of that of that whole yeah. So and I've seen it from you know from the inside because he's my brother, and uh, I don't like it. I, I have a good good friend who whom I grew up with, played in bands with, and. He became very successful writing songs uh, in Nashville. Got a publishing deal first. Uh, yeah. got, art, got an artist development deal and uh, did okay with that. But his bread and butter has been really writing songs for other people. But it's uh, it's almost you know Owens talked about this time and time again. It's like they just get uh, um, uh, like body snatched. It's yeah. like I don't. Where is this person that I knew? Well, and I think Owen's right when he says that it's not when you're at the mid level of a lot of this stuff. It's not that people are actually like telling you what to say. Yeah, you're being reined in by a system that kind of like subtly tells you what not to talk about publicly or what you know. Well, and how much of that pressure do we feel today? Like, and we're not even in it. You know, it's like there's always that pressure to. But but I think on that level, it's just so. It, it it's so much more prevalent. Yeah. Okay, I could talk to you guys, man. I, this has been a great. I love the way this conversation has flowed. I hope it's been, I hope it's been interesting for other people. But I got to kick both of you out because they keep telling me that that uh, Swoo Bear's showing up on the list. It's not showing up on the list for me. You don't. Nobody has to tell me anything. But I'm going to kick both you guys out to see if I can get Flocal or Sea Level or Grungy. We'll get Grungy and Flocal uh, in here, and then we'll try to go from there. But I appreciate right. both coming on. Thank you Thanks so much, Joe. Anthony. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you. We'll be on. Bye-bye. All right. We'll see you, man. Okay, let's try this again. Hope everybody's having a good time. I'm glad Titty Bear is here, hometown. It's great to see you guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring Sleep Deprived on so he can talk about music. I'm inviting Flo Cal and Grungy. We'll see if we get them in here.
T Bunners is here. I think this is really going to work. Look at that. Oh, second. There we are. What's up? Hey, what's up? Took us some I dinner. can't. I can't. I can't see anybody. Don't worry about it. All right, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> we're not gonna. Who's who's missing? No, we're not gonna restart the live. I only do that when I kick Finksburg out, and I got to get him back in. Reggie's on that Wisconsin Wi-Fi. That's why you can't see anything. That's been happening a lot on here. It's just the way it is. Just audio. Can you see yourself? I yeah, I can see, see myself. Everybody. I can hear you guys, and I can see myself. So let's, let's go. Good to go. How was how was the uh, how was the jam, Grungy? Did you play a a show at the CBD shop? Um. Yeah, sort of. I guess. Hang on. Hang on. Um. Yeah, actually, we're having a bear meet up right now. Um, awesome. Q Cum Fag is here, and uh, well, he's the only one left now. But yeah, <laughs> we're, we're having a bear meet up. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, fried rice. Who am I talking to right now? I don't even know who I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Bob and and Reggie. Flo, is that Flo Cal? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah uh, on your dog uh, tried to sexually assault. Do you remember that person? Yeah, well, you're not the only one. <laughs> and uh, Owen's on here, but he's he he's just basically observing. He's it's the first time he's joined, but he doesn't want to talk. Okay, what's up? What's up, Big Bear? <laughs> What did uh, Grungy? What What do you have to say about playing on stage with Owen? How was that for you? Um, it was amazing. Um, I've, I've since I first started watching Owen and like watching him play piano, I thought like you know it'd be incredible to play music with him. And um, oftentimes I would be jamming along with the piano stream and like <laughs> so doing rocking in the free world with ira was like amazing definitely not what i like had dreamed of you know <laughs> like <laughs> I, I always envisioned like epic beautiful like jams with with owen and then like that happened and it was so funny and awesome it was like yeah it was just like I always dreamed of like playing the most epic, beautiful stuff, you know, with them. And then that amazing, funny, hilarious thing happened with Rocket in the Free World. So it's all good, you know? He was, was awesome. He was, was incredible. He was so down for having a good time once he got up there. And it was real adventurous of him. You guys, we were all talking him into it. He was like, because we wanted to do that song. He was like, well, I don't know that song. And we're like, it's three chords. We wrote it down for him and put it on his piano. We, we, you know, we messed around for like a minute teaching him the song, and then, you know, he it's hilarious. It, it was fine with it, and you guys, just something about that. Uh, you know, I put that clip up on on my Instagram. It was just forty five seconds of the solo, like me playing a solo, and then you singing, keep on rocking in the free world, and then. Uh, Owen said something in the Ira voice right at the end of it. That's the only video we have, you know, because Adam's gonna never gonna share the document footage with us, and that's that's what bridge. But Camera Bear just happened to catch that forty-five seconds, and he—that's the only video Camera Bear shot for the whole festival. He just, he, I think he wanted to catch um, Amy and the boys dancing and stuff in front of him, and that's why he decided to start filming it. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, and you got well. What I wanted yeah. to say was. You guys, I mean, Flo Cal looked like he was having such a blast just playing playing the rhythm on that song. Yeah, it was. And, and the band, you guys, you guys were playing so great. Um, it, it, we, it really sounds like a band. We sound like we've been playing together for years, and it, it wasn't that. It just yeah. Yeah, that was so fun. I got a funny a funny story about 
from the when uh we were doing um gunner's dream i asked owen what chord it was when it when it goes um hold on to the dream you know on dream i thought it'd be cool to just hit that chord like a big power chord so i like asked him what it was and he's like he just he's, he was so funny he's like i don't know and then yeah. he's like dude that was so funny man he's such I figured a, it out though yeah it's g and actually i i learned gunner's dream i mean like a week after the festival uh sitting around the fire with jacobet and uh van dutch we figured it out or i figured it out um so yeah i'll have that one in the bag raised five on the on the one chord do you do the raised um i don't know there's some kind of weird g in it i'm not yeah. sure what it is i don't know well, well yeah, but, yeah. acknowledge that and play the right chord there i won't give you a hard time <laughs> yeah, it's a g chord when it goes hold on to the dream it's a, it's a g chord it's it's during so. the it's on the four chord it, it's just a rise thing that it just drives the progression during the verse but don't worry about it i'm just talking about that one part where it goes dream you know that's, i don't know what you're talking about so don't worry about it no worries Details. look at this a new song yeah what's up with this telly is that your guitar no it's uh it's jj hemcrete's uncles but i think i might um buy it he wants 450 for it wasn't that the exact number I no. told you about you telling me anything that's the exact number you said joe yeah i was gonna <laughs> offer him four i was gonna offer him 400 because i figured that's a good price buddy <laughs> no, he wants 450 but yeah but look somebody uh somebody carved somebody carved jacobat's mom into it though so <laughs> yeah that's true well, that's not a sticker. He carved it in there. Yeah, somebody carved that in there. Yeah. So well, I guess I guess I'll have to cover that up if I uh, if I bring it to the festival next year. <laughs> Put a book. Know, keep it. It sounds keep it kid great. friendly, you know. It sounds great in the videos. Um, those are you know those are cool. The Mexican ones are cool. It's cool. I like it. I I I, li I really like it. I don't think it sounds good at, as sounds as good as my GNL though. Um, but the GNL has better pickups. Yeah, I don't know. This this has a Seymour Duncan, so I don't know. This well, it's cool. Got the pickup. I want it. I do want it. Changed in it. What's that? Somebody changed the pickups. Uh, I don't know, man. Maybe. I didn't ask him, but it looks like. Ah, it looks like uh i think i'm no expert joe but i think this the uh, bridge might be the original one i think this one might have been swapped out though i don't know yeah probably yeah, that's not original yeah, I don't, yeah I don't, i've never seen a actually uh, it's definitely it's definitely been swapped out because look at the uh, you can see that somebody's kind of worked done work there they put it it's a strap, strap pickup in a telly uh telly lead spot yeah got it I've never seen I've never seen never seen this before, never seen that pickup before. It's one of those hot but, yeah. but it's a cool guitar, I like it. And Flo it matches my shirt. Yeah. Yeah, Flocal, I know you talked about this a lot with Stuntman when you went on hang with Bears, but yeah. since we're doing a music show here, can you uh tell everybody yeah. what your experience of playing the festival was like? all your the whole experience going and everything yeah uh it was awesome um just starting with the music like uh you know i think what was so cool about sunday night was i didn't i didn't play any guitar during my set you know that's right so it was fun to get up there and actually play some guitar so hopefully i can uh, uh work that more into it next year because that was a lot of fun yeah you sounded great you and i were on the same side of the stage so that was fun yeah thanks for the amp man the amp uh amp sounded great uh i think i just went in straight in with that just a tube screamer in front of it and i don't, I don't think i even used it sounded great you had the right attitude yeah it was just the whole weekend was just uh dude, i was just appreciative to be there and 
the the vibes were great everybody was yeah it was uh a surreal but really really very cool experience well, you and I got to hang out quite a bit, just kind of after just some of the nights afterward. We got to hang. It was we, had, you and I had a good time. It was, it was really nice. Yeah. You were, um, you were kind of like hanging out by the stage a lot. Um, yeah, it was I stuck around the stage most of the weekend? I think. Yeah, it was really, it was really cool. Yeah, and here's yeah, it was that, cool, that cool was, going out to the uh, to the bonfires af afterwards as well, and you know, like you only have so much time there, and you want to meet all these people and do everything, but. I did wind up staying around the stage and just hanging around the tent area most of the time. Right. Yeah, I really. I did, go, I did go do the hay toss on Saturday. The hay. Uh, I wasn't on the field, but I was on the end where we were with, over with like Finks and uh, uh, Candor. We were over there uh, putting the hay into the barn. You know, unloading the trailers and putting it in the barn. Yeah. But that was that was a really cool part of the weekend too. Getting the getting involved in that. I don't know why Candor's not Candor Bear's not in here, but he's going to have some big news for the Bears in case anybody. He's doesn't busy. Know. He's got some big news, life news. But anyway, that's all. That's all to be decided by him. But no, I like your I liked your set too, Flo Cal. It was it was fun playing that that those songs, and it was kind of ballsy for you to just try to be Ozzy Osbourne and just be the front man. It was... <laughs> I had a good time. I, I thought it went over well. You know. Uh... We didn't have a, a ton of rehearsal time, of course, but we, uh, you know, everybody I talked to, uh, and uh, who knows how much they were just being nice, but most everybody had good stuff to say about it. And I was asking them specifically about how it sounded, you know, and could they hear everything? And yeah, I got a, a lot of positive feedback. So that was awesome. Hopefully, if we do this uh, next year, it's going to be even better and tighter. They weren't I'm sorry, just, I missed it. Just buttering you up. All right, good. It's all good, Grungy. You drove a long ways, bro. I really, I was really looking forward to singing, singing through the fog with you. Yeah, I missed it. Fucking. It's all right. I need yeah, a super chat. Opportunities. What's up, Tiff? Grungy, what's uh, what's on the agenda for you? You gonna just stay there a while? What's going on for you? Um. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. I can, I have a six month visa, so I can stay till March 1st, I think. Um, I don't know. I might go home for, I don't know. I might go home for Christmas maybe, but maybe I won't. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Are you thinking other I'm thinking maybe I should maybe I should go back maybe I should go back before the six months, so that uh, just to stay on good terms, you know, with the with the yeah. border people. Yeah. You know, I I don't mean the American ones. I mean the Canadian ones because the American ones, they they were she the lady was super nice to me. Uh, I got I got through in like 30, 30 seconds. I was through, That's and. Right. If you guys know Runner Bear and Walker Bear are like legends, like super upstanding citizens. <laughs> Runner Bear said they got they had to they made them pull over and then they had to wait half an hour, which I found super funny because they let me like right in. Like, well, I think you went to, were in the middle of the night, though. So. It was like one thirty. Yeah. 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 That was funny. Yeah. It was funny. The girl was like, what brings you to America? And I, I looked right at her and I was like, I'm going to the Bertaria Times National Festival in Texas County, Missouri, ma'am. And she's like, awesome. <laughs> and she's like, I guess she saw my, she must have seen my guitars and stuff. She's like, so are you playing or just attending? And I'm like, I'm just attending, ma'am. Because I had seen that stream of Squirtus from like six or eight months ago or whatever, where Squirtus was crying about how he got denied entry yeah because um they had assumed that he'd be getting paid for doing a talk or whatever yeah so i was like i don't want them to think i'm getting paid which i mean i already knew anyway because like you know you got to be smart when you're crossing borders right so i was like i'm just attending ma'am and she goes great i love your dog see you later <laughs> and i'm like 
okay. I, I was like, I better get out of here fast before they, uh, you know, before they uh, realize what they've done, you know. But that's pretty funny. Yeah, Squirtus is yeah, probably of wearing capri pants, and we don't allow capri pants here. There's all yeah. kinds of stories of uh, they're they're touchy about letting people go either from Canada to the U.S. or vice versa if they think you're going to be making money over on the other side. Yeah. Well, I know there are, I, I anticipate, you know, a harder time getting back into Canada than I did coming in here. Yes. Um, I don't blame them. I wouldn't let you back in. Fuck you. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel, I mean, Adam Carolla has this whole big story about getting screwed at the Canada border to go do a comedy. You know, there's that big Toronto thing that they do every year. And Kimmel and Carolla were going up there for the man show back when that was on. And they were basically just lying, you know. And, of course, you're going to get in trouble if you're lying at the border. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> That's, yeah, no, uh, not the Toronto Film Festival. There's actually a comedy. There's a, there used to be a thing in, in Toronto, a Toronto Comedy Festival, and it was a big deal for Americans to go up there, and you could actually get discovered by going up there. There used to be a lot of uh, funny guys coming out of Canada. Like, there was a lot of comedians and actors. Comedian the, greatest actors but... times, the greatest of all time came out of there. Was that Norm? Norm yep. McDonald was he Canadian? Yeah. Yep. yep. No. I thought he, he, meant, he was the I last John one too, I think. The last funny Canadian. How dare you? Two songs in the Hopper Flocal? Uh finally, yeah. So since the festival I came back and I've uh been really busy working. Yeah. Um filling in for some people who've been out sick and taking vacation and uh and then trying to finish the cd which i finally got done so cool. now that's finished yeah i'm working on a couple of new songs always always got some ideas uh there's several older ones that i could flesh out as well but uh, a couple of new ideas i've been working on the last few days those last two you put out were really nice i like the one that was real guitar centered uh has great guitar tone in the beginning and uh i like the whole thing Cool. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, got several of the CDs shipping out tomorrow, so people were excited about that. I wasn't sure how that would go. I only ordered uh, about 50 of them because... And you know, uh, tell everybody where they can CDs. go buy that. Uh, just have to message me. I don't have it. I don't already have it listed anywhere. You can just uh, DM me here Yeah. Uh, on Instagram or through the Barataria Times app, Right. and uh, we'll get it set up. I'm asking uh, ten bucks for it for the CD, and then uh, I'm charging usually five bucks for the shipping, just depending on where it's going. Sure. So fifteen bucks. Your deliver. record coming out grungy. What? My record? I don't know, but Grungy's um, gonna do a, a live a live album. I think what suits him. I don't know, man. I don't. Know. I got good a good name for an album. And a good name for an album. Uh, I don't know. I don't know when my album's coming out. <laughs> Got to actually complete songs first. You know. Music Bear says, I really want to collab with you, gents. Yes. Yeah, that'd be a cool uh, a cool workup, huh? Me, Grunty, yeah. and Music Bear. I bet we could come up with something cool. Yeah, we could. <laughs> Crunchy has a purple non-gay songbook. <laughs> yeah, I do. I bought a purple binder at uh, Dollar General. By the way, Dollar General is like super not a dollar store. It's like really expensive. But anyway, I bought a binder and it happened to be purple because they didn't have a lot of colors and whatever. And it's the non-gay purple songbook. Yeah, that's true. Did, uh, did Wobbly wants to know if you shipped to Canada. Oh okay. uh, yeah, I just answered it in the chat, but uh, I haven't looked into that pricing wise. But uh, I would for sure. I don't have it, have any idea what it costs, but maybe when I go to the post office tomorrow, I can find out. Grungy, do you ship your CD to Canada? I don't have a CD, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
CDs are so outdated, bro. I don't know why anybody would do them. No, I was really worried nobody would be interested in them because, like, you know, do people really listen to CDs anymore? Uh, I still have a CD player in my car. I don't use it that much, but I do. It does work. Yeah, a lot of people still have them in their cars. Yeah. Yes. So, cool. What's up, neighbor bear? Are you, yeah. uh, when you play at the CBD store, Grungy, are you putting out a tip jar? Are you making any money? What's going on there? Um, I'm not really putting any effort into that. Um, JJ made me a tip jar and uh, put it out the first night. Um, uh, I don't know. Like, there's no PA system or anything, so it's like a bunch of people hanging around and you know, I'll play a little bit, but it's, it doesn't feel like official, really. No offense. No offense. Uh, they're not <laughs> listening anyway. Uh, it's, uh, it's like, I just, you know, I'm, I'm over here. Right? Yeah. Yep. It's like a coffee shop gig. Does, uh, I was wondering, when you're making these videos, are there other um, shops in that shopping center that are hearing all that, or do you have any? It's not a shopping center. It's uh, it's like the main street in town. Okay. Um. Oh. oh fuck. Hey man, how's it going? Cool. Oh yeah, here we go. You too, bro. That's uh, Beaver Dam, right? Yeah. I'm... There's a building over here. I don't know if you can see that, but it says professional building. Yes. That's. Uh, I like to joke that that's the professional building, and all the other buildings are amateurs. That's that's a joke I can get behind. It's funny, right? I don't know. Look at that small town USA going on there. Have you, uh, is that how you got a lot of Canadian towns that look like that as well? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, I find that, um, yeah, you know, small town Canada, small town America, uh, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Yeah. Neighbor, uh, neighbor bear said he was just in Beaver Dam. That is cool. Yeah. He was just here. Yeah. We had some uh, family friends who lived there when I was a kid. We lived, I don't know how far away Waterloo is. I think it's about 30, 30 or 40 miles away. So we used to go. It's cool. Um, it, yeah, it's cool up here. Um, I went to Madison the other day, and uh, it was like nighttime, and uh, um, seeing the Capitol building, like, I didn't get like super close to it, but you could see it from from where I was driving, and it was really it was really cool. And there's some cool uh, there's some cool buildings in Beaver Dam that uh, you know Berserker Bear would uh, would be interested in. That's right. When yeah, I kid, Madison's my, cool. When I was a kid, my dad worked at the Catholic Hospital in Madison. So oh yeah. Yeah, it was cool. I haven't been to Milwaukee yet. But. My dad would go. We would go with my dad up in his sports car up to the up to the up to Madison because we lived about you know thirty miles away, and uh, we would just sit in the lobby of the hospital while he did his rounds. So he was only up there for like an hour and a half. So we just sit in the lobby and read magazines, and you know, doctor's kid just hanging out in the lobby. It's weird. <laughs> Um, I needed to buy, uh, strings the other day. What's going on with my phone here? Get away from me. Um, it's kind of hard to find music stores. Like, yeah. Uh, there's not a music store in Beaver Dam. The closest one is in, um, Watertown, which is like half an hour away. Yeah. So I went there and there's a couple different ones. So I went to one and I got my strings and what, what else do I need? Oh, I bought a patch cable. Oh, yeah, I bought a patch cable because somebody left uh, the festival with one of my patch cables. Huh. So, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to say who it was. I don't know, but 
anyway um so i went to this one music store bought a patch cable and then i was like you know googling where's all the guitar stores at so i go to this one and it's this older guy and i think he might have you know joe probably would really get along with him it's all acoustic stuff there's no electric stuff in the store but I, I like walk in there and it's really cool he's got like records and stuff it's like a really cool little store and i'm like you know man you got any like pedals like i'm looking for a fuzz like do you got a pedal section <laughs> he's, like, he's like he's like no no electric stuff just an acoustic store and he's like i don't think i'd get along <laughs> well just because like he had like an attitude you know so i don't know do you guys oh, that was funny michael jones famously uh was trying to battle against amplified music when he was doing his mandolin stuff in the pubs over in uk yeah dutch yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, there's some hidden meanings in Ben Dutch's um, posts, I can tell. Totally. Uh, yeah. Jokes. Yeah. Yeah. Probably why the uh, director bear, or one of those other Mexican guys, got your court cable, huh? Because it is kind of a tool of the trade, right? Yeah, he probably stole it and thought it was yeah, like a probably. camera port or something. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. I want to uh, get C level in here since he's still in here. Which one of you guys wants to volunteer yourselves to take the exit door? Uh, I can. I can head out. I was about uh -huh. to head out soon anyway because I got to eat dinner. I don't mind. Well, stick around, Grungy. Okay, Flocal. Thanks a lot, and uh, great to have you on. Thank you. Later, Flocal. See you, Grungy. Take care, man. Good seeing you. Oh, now C level needs a couple minutes. Oh, a couple minutes. Oh, we can go two more minutes. Okay, two minutes till sea level's ready. And I'm going to go you, with my daughter. Well, Cal, when you, you mentioned that you played when you were younger and you kind of came back around to music. Did you did yeah. you completely stop playing music or did you keep it going in the meantime? Um, I, I would play some. Uh, I you know, always had guitar, so I'd play at home. And then uh, – some of the guys that I used to be in a band with, we would get together and jam just for fun once in a while. So the the singer uh, that I used to play with, he was he's a pretty prolific songwriter. So even though we weren't playing shows, oh. still would write songs and we would go over and jam them just for fun. So that kept me in music a little bit here and there. And then uh, that was that was when I was in Florida still. Since I've been in California, uh, I haven't really done too much jamming with other people. Very little. So. Was that like a high school band or something you did after high school? The first one, the early stuff. Started in uh, started in junior high, so I had a oh a friend of mine that grew up uh, just down the street from where I, I I did, and we were in a couple of bands, uh, junior high and high school, with uh, you know about four or five different guys that kind of went back and forth between the bands, and then uh, we continued the band we had after high school for probably about four or five years before it kind of dissolved the drummer got married and moved out of state and what kind of music was you... over yeah we were uh similar to what i'm doing now probably a little bit heavier we we're kind of sound gardenish i'd say sort yeah. of like we we actually won there used to be this independent magazine in florida called the jam jam magazine it's all local cool. music it kind of covered the whole state and we one best metal band in 1993 but we were we were kind of a little more on the grunge side of things right we weren't i mean we were metal influenced but i'd say uh yeah very close to like soundgarden we had a lot of that seattle influence for sure well really and and grunge didn't really come in until 92 so these magazines they had a category called metal but yeah grunge wasn't even really like if, unless they were really really fast with changing their category yeah. That's just they didn't write. They didn't have a grunge category. That's a good point. Yeah. But you know, a song that came along that made me realize everything was about to change was "Been Caught Stealing" by Jane's Addiction. That's a good song. The feel of that song, I was like, finally, finally, music is going to change again. You know, and I <laughs> feel it. So that changed that changed it up a bit. Yeah. They had like a great Dane dog barking in the beginning. 
I just love the sound. Of the, I love the sound of the guitars on that and Perry Farrell's voice. I just I love that song. Yeah, yeah. James Addiction was cool. Perry Farrell used to uh, he used to have like this effects rack. I saw him at Lollapalooza once. Yeah, and he had his his own effects like right there next to him on stage that he would adjust, you know, and add to his vocals. That was really unique. You didn't ever see any other any other singers doing that. Uh, he talked about that. I remember uh, reading interviews with him at the time, and he talked about that because he he approached Ooh. his voice like an instrument. So he he definitely was very conscious of wanting to recreate the sounds that they made on the records in the live performances, and that that was uh, very smart of him. Yeah, and you know he's not like uh, got like a great voice or anything. He just had a, a unique voice, and he knew how to use those effects to really enhance the song. You know. Well, then his band after Jane's Addiction broke up was Porno for Pyros. That's right. That's right. I had a I had a couple of I that CD. Uh, I didn't buy very many records back then, but because I like Jane's Addiction, when Porno for Pyros came out, I bought that first record, and it was right after I got divorced from my wife and my. My sons would come stay with me on the weekends because I had, you know, shared shared custody. And uh, my son Scott was about six, and he really liked the sound of porno for pyros. So he would always, you know, want to want me to play it when he'd come over. And I guess he told his mom the name of the band or something. So she calls him, "Why are you playing pornos for my sons?" Blah blah blah. You know. <laughs> I said, it's just the name of a band. It's just the name of a band. It's just the soundtrack. We're only playing the audio, okay? <laughs> but were you, so were you guys mostly doing originals then? Oh, yeah, pretty much all originals. I, yeah, we, we would do a cover song here or there. In fact, we did a kind of a heavy version of uh, Mother by Pink Floyd. Uh, so we throw in, we would do an Alice in Chains song here or there. We did... Uh, uh, I don't even remember what song it was now. I know we did Sunshine, but it was early days. Yeah. That's a great song, man. Yeah. yeah I was, love that song. Yeah, it's yeah, great. That's a fun one to do. <clears throat> but yeah, we did, uh, we, 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 there's a, there's a very famous totally in the death metal world in Tampa, Florida. It's called More Sound Recording. I'm not even sure it's still around, but all the big death metal bands used to go there. Okay. And, and record. And we, we did, uh, a couple of albums there. Uh, one was just like a six-song EP, and then we did another ten-song CD. Are those up yeah. anywhere where people can hear them now? I don't. I have. I have the the second one we did actually never got released. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. We had a a family friend that put in some did put in some money to invest in the band, and uh, he paid for the recording. But then we kind of had a blow up with him and. It was mm. creative stuff, and it just it never got released. And then the band wound up splitting up later, soon after that. So, yeah, I have some some digital recordings of that, but no, uh, I don't have the master. It's like a a digital recording from a cassette tape, so it's not very good quality. But the other one I do, I have uh, copies. I think a few copies left of this six song CD. Maybe I'll throw that in with some of the other the other ones that people are ordering. Since they're buying my CD, I could throw that one in just for something uh, extra. Yeah, I think people would like to hear it. Yeah, yeah, it's a little different. Uh, some cool stuff on there. I just played guitar and wrote some of the songs, but our drummer was uh, excellent. Like we, every time we played a show, that's what we got comments on. Man, your drummer is just awesome. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> a good drummer is essential. Yeah, yeah he he was really good. Yeah. Well, cool. I'm gonna head out of here. I gotta. I'm gonna go eat some dinner. Thanks a lot, and we'll yeah, see you. Soon. It was fun hang. All right. See you. My flow, Cal. See you, Grudgy. Later. Let's see about sea level now. Or maybe he got himself presentable. He said he needed a couple minutes. Yeah, sea level, very yay. Man, sea level's got some really good. Um, thoughts about life he's very knowledgeable really smart guy uh grungy i don't know if you've seen his posts in the speakeasy but uh, he's uh he's been posting some great stuff in the speakeasy it gets a little cool, man but it's really good stuff sweet 
I decided to trim my beard up, Joe, but I didn't go full gagging. Yeah, well, I just, you know, it's getting a little. Uh, I was get, I was just, you know, I was a little scraggly, and it's starting to be all long down here, and it was looking a little stupid. So, I can't stand. Uh, I can't stand um, trimming beards. That's why I just shaved it off. Mm. I, it's. Yeah. Oh, good. It's good to have a it's good to have a beard a beard reset every once in a while. It's it's, it's good. It's a good it's a good thing to do. <laughs> no one should go full gagging. Yeah, well, never never go full gagging. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like we're in another situation where nobody else can come in. It just keeps shaving away. Let's see if Civil Album can come in here. It's doing the same thing it did earlier. It's. Uh, you know, it's just a software problem. <laughs> Dutch. Dude. Oh, man. Dutch is so funny, man. Fuck, that guy's dude, funny. Dude, yep. <laughs> this is great stuff. Oh, <laughs> uh, look. Uh, What's up, Kev? Kev's here. How's it going, Kev? Hey, Grungy, try kicking yourself out because it's doing this thing again. Uh, it's doing yeah, here we go. It's the roundabout way to get me out. Okay, fine, Joe. 